Uh, anyway, before I get to that, we have with us uh, Alex Epstein. And Alex is, uh, I think all of you know who Alex is, but Alex, of course, is the author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuel, worked at the Institute with me for many years. And um, I thought I'd bring Alex on today uh, to talk about to talk about coronavirus, but really to, to tap into his expertise in what he did around climate change, because I think this is, it's really interesting. Um, the whole issue is how do you respond to emergency? And let's assume, and Alex has, I've seen him do this, assume climate change is real to some extent. How do we think about how to respond to a crisis? And I think it'd, it'd be useful to have a conversation about how to think about how to respond to coronavirus. So hi, Alex. Hey. Hope they haven't shut down Southern California yet. Uh, no, not yet. I mean, I, it, it's really notable, you know, how much of a difference I think it makes to live in different places. I'm sure you'll talk about Puerto Rico, but I'm, I'm in Laguna Beach. And I just even think about here versus San Francisco, where I lived a couple of years ago. And I'm, I'm really scared for my friends in San Francisco and people in cities. Uh, and we could talk about why, but just there's the combination of a virus that's scary and then the behavior of people that's scary and then the, all of the government induced irrationality in the behavior. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And I hope Laguna and the rest of Southern California get spared that, but, but it's, 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 it's hard to tell where this is going. And then, you know, you've even got some, you know, private hysteria, voluntary hysteria going on as well that is going to constrain life. But let me quickly fill everybody in on Puerto Rico because I, you know, I just heard basically 30 minutes ago, um, there was a press release from the governor of, of Puerto Rico that basically she's shutting down the island, which means no uh, businesses are allowed to stay open. No, I don't know yet about restaurants, which is really, really important to my life. Uh, grocery stores are allowed to stay open and, and the food chain, kind of anything related to food is supposed to stay open. I don't know if that relates to restaurants, but everything else basically is is being is being shut down uh no more cruise ships that they already i think decided a couple of days ago but you know nothing no activity no jobs no work no no pursuit of day-to-day -day values until the end of the month so this is for two weeks now to me for me i work at home anyway but for me the big thing is restaurants and uh I, we don't have food, much food at home because we rely on going out pretty much every night. The food here is fantastic and relatively cheap and, and the restaurants are great. And uh, so as soon as we heard this, my wife rushed out to go to the supermarket to buy whatever she can uh, for the next two weeks under the assumption the restaurants are going to be closed. We would never hoard food. We would never go to a grocery store and just stop because I, you know, I think, I think mostly that is irrational, but now the government has put us in a position where we have no choice. You know, it, you know, it's, it's taken the decision out of our hands in terms of what activities to engage in and whatnot, and, and basically forced us to go hoard food, which I'm sure everybody else in Puerto Rico is doing right now. So I feel bad about doing the show while she's over there. Uh, so I'll, I'll probably, as soon as this is over, go join her and you know, fighting the lines and fighting the other, the hordes and getting food. But this relates directly to the post you, you made. So let's start with that. And then I've got a bunch of sure. others I want to talk about. And you wrote in the post um, that, you know, what's happening is that the government, government primarily, although I think some, some even private firms and private individuals are doing this, um, where they're increasingly treating containment as an unlimited value that wants any amount of disruption of normal life. And yet we all know disrupting normal life has a cost, which nobody, nobody, is, nobody is calculating. That is, it, it, there's, a, there's a threat. Clearly Corona is a threat, certainly to some people more than others, but it's clearly a threat. But it's become, the, that threat has become the ultimate value, which eliminating that threat is now the number one value uh, beyond anything else. And, if, and what are the consequences of thinking in, you know, that way? So, I mean, let's talk about what is normal life. I mean, so, I mean, normal life is basically your chosen values. Mm -hmm. That's what normal life is. And, and it means how you're choosing to spend your irreplaceable time. 
you know, you don't get that much of it. And then part of it is how you spend that time determines how much of it you get and how much the future quality is. So if you just take one example, a huge, millions and millions of people, their productive ability, their ability to produce value that sustains their life in a given amount of time, it's just completely interwoven with in-person social interaction. And I mean, I have this myself, I'm not in the worst situation, but a lot of my income and my business's income, I have several people I employ, depends on in-person speaking events. Yep. What's happened to that? And so it's not that we can say it's wrong necessarily to shut that down, but you really need to be clear that is a huge loss of value. And that's just one of, of many examples. And I don't hear that acknowledged. And I also don't hear any concern with, uh, in part with how, how long that's gonna go on. So you can imagine somebody said, okay, we've got a plan, it's two weeks, we're gonna have to endure a lot of hardship, but- Whoops, your sound just dropped. One second, one second, one second. You went, you went. I know, I'm, this, is, this is bugging out. Uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing it go, so it okay. might happen a couple more times, but I apologize. It'll encourage me to do shorter answers. Um, so just, just to uh, complete, like, if you acknowledge, so I just want to, I mean, maybe one broader thing is we're, we want to talk about is just the value of objectivist philosophy to this kind of issue. And here's a case where if you value human life and the pursuit of values, whatever the magnitude of the corona threat, you'd be taking very seriously any restriction in people's normal pursuit of values. And you would really have a plan about how long that is and, and make it worth it versus you have people saying, yeah, well, maybe it's 18 months. Maybe your life is going to be disrupted for, I mean, that's 18 months of my life. I'm 39 going on 40. So that means I'd be 41 by the time this is over. What's going to happen to my company? What's, I don't want to tell you how old I will be in 18 I months. I know how old you are. You're always 19 years older than Round I Round number. It's a scary I know. You're number. Gonna be, you're going to be 60. I'll be 60 in 18 months. I know. Yeah, that's, so it's, it's just... It's, it need, this needs to be valued. And I don't trust people who say, oh, I've got a really precise account of the threat but they see no threat whatsoever in disrupting people's lives. And I've seen this when I watch Sam Harris talk with a lot of the smart kind of tech people, yep. they just trivialize this. So that's just a big flag. And it, this, this concern needs to be integrated. Well, I think it's, it's, it's two things. It's one that they don't really, they don't re haven't really internalized the idea of, of values and, and individual values and what that means to individuals. And the second is they very much take a, uh, philosopher King's approach to this. They're smarter than everybody else. They know more than everybody else. They're rational, whereas they assume most people are not. And therefore, they can pick, in a sense, our values for us. And you don't know how risky this is. So I'm going to tell you, this should be your primary value. And this this relates to the whole question of who should decide, right? Now, this, we can talk about the role of government in such situations, and we'll talk about that. But the fact is that part of the assumption here is that if we get information about the true risks involved and, and what it means to be sick and what it means, what the risks are involved in social interaction, we won't make the right decisions. That we are either too emotional, too stupid, too irrational to make the right decisions. And that some authority, whether it's a Sam Harris, an intellectual authority, or some authority at the political level, who should therefore impose, in a sense, rationality on us? And objectivism is really one of the, really the only philosophy that tells us that whole way of thinking is, is wrong, right? That nobody else can choose your values for you, that by choosing values for you, enforcing those values for you, they, negate, they negate the whole idea of values. Values have to be personal. And that human beings have the capacity to be rational, and this is a time to encourage them to do that, to encourage them to think, to encourage them to actually focus and to actually pursue their values rationally. And what we really want from the experts, people like Sam Harris, is information, is, is maybe an approach to thinking. He can say, this is how I approach it. This is the way I think of these things. And, but count on individuals to do their own thinking and to make their own choices about the values that they pursue. Yeah, and, and I mean, my integrating this with my last point, I mean, these, you know, many of these, these experts, I mean, I regard their view of values as very uh, alien to mine, and yes. I believe alien to a lot of people. So I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, I was riding Uber 
yesterday to go to a friend's house. People might think, oh, that's insane. Like, how could you, but so I don't even want to talk about my value calculation. I was on an airplane <laughs> Thursday and Friday. So. But, but if I just even think about the driver, like think about this person's even just physical livelihood, like he's doing this to pay the rent. He can get kicked out of his house. This can, this can change the whole trajectory of his life. And there, and so there's just even the economic side, the, the production side of things, not even recognizing life depends on production above all. So if you impede people's ability to produce values, then you destroy their ability to live. There's no acknowledgement of that, but also the quality issue. Think about the way people are talking about life. They say like this many lives could be saved, but what, what does that really mean? I mean, it's mostly elderly people and it's saying that they'll die sooner than they otherwise would. And that's and that's that's a real negative. I mean, you want to avoid that, but they're also saying, oh yeah, maybe 18 months, maybe you're you're gonna lose this time and then lose your productive ability. And so all we have is time. It's not like people have this idea of, oh, either it's life and death or it doesn't matter. Either you're gonna die immediately or it doesn't matter, but really it's you only have so much time. You wanna make the most of that time. And so it is really taking away someone's life to take away a huge chunk of their time. And, and there's just so little value of quality of life uh, and because most of the major philosophies don't really value the quality of life on earth for the individual. No, and, and, and you know, and the quality of life for that Uber driver is going to be hurt even more than it is for me. I'll, I'll manage. I can yeah. afford not to have any income coming in for a while, um, but he can't. And, uh, you know, people who pretend to care about the poor, or the working class, or the that goes completely out the window in cases like this where they... Um, it, in a sense, they want everybody to be dependent on them because their solution to him, the solution to uh, the Uber driver is to give him welfare, right? The solution is to expand social programs. We saw this with a new bill going through the house. They want to do all these goodies, throw all goodies uh, to, to people rather than, again, let people make decisions about their own values, let people go out and, and, and decide. You know, it might, be, it might make sense for the Uber driver to stop driving. I'm not, you know, it depends on his circumstances on his risk tolerance and, and on, you know, maybe he's um, got some lung disease. And if he gets a coronavirus, he goes, he, you know, he could die. His probability is really, really high. He would stop. But as what always happens with government, they, they plaster all of us with the same, you know, the same assumption, the same, there's no personal values. There is values dictated from the top down and we're all supposed to just mindlessly follow uh, and, 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 and obey in a sense. And we're going to talk about, I think we're going to talk next. I'm really looking forward to this, just about what real capitalism would mean for this yeah, kind of situation. Right? Two things I want to cover before we get to that, but yes, okay. we're going to talk to that because I think it's going to be really interesting, but the few things that I want to cover and, and actually, and then we've got a bunch of super chat questions, but we'll get to them in the end. Um, so, and I think, I think some of this covers this. So I want to, I want to cover a couple of things before we get to that. One is, so does this pandemic or any pandemic prove uh, first that the government has to run healthcare, right? That, that this is, and I've seen this, right? The Bernie Sanders and his supporters and uh, people in Europe saying, oh, you Americans, you're screwed because we, we have, you know, like Italy, right? They have uh, socialized yeah. healthcare, so they're doing great. Um, it, but this is proof that uh, we need a central authority they could run all this. Uh, so, I mean- And they I, often say we need it as a, like, it needs to be a right. Like this is proof. Yeah. And, and I mean, I regard this as definitive proof that it's catastrophic for it to be viewed as a yes. right. Yes, because once you view it as a right, the whole system, the whole system collapses. And what you're relying on in a crisis like this right now is doctors doing amazing work is pharmaceutical companies coming up with new innovations and, and solving the core of the problem. Uh, it, you know, uh, hospitals being motivated to expand production in a sense by expanding the number of beds and things like that. You're dependent on the, the market really working and the incentives working and it not being something that the government provides as um, you know, in a in a coerced way, but you're dependent on the human mind now being free to innovate, to produce, to create, and to treat people to to to, to solve the problem, which goes away completely 
once you term it as a so-called right, once uh, government now provides it and turns doctors, nurses, pharmaceutical companies, medical innovation into uh, government bureaucracies. Yeah, I mean, I have a like really strong view on this. So uh, I mean, let's just say, what does it mean to say something is a right? I mean, if you say there's a right to, the, to a value, it means it's, or anything really, it means it's the government's job to define it, A, mm -hmm. and to control its pursuit, B. So if you think about something like, and people think, oh, like education, that's great, that should be right. Okay, then the government gets to define what education is, and it gets to control the pursuit uh, of it by force, versus if you have rights to action, but not rights to values, then all the government says is you can't interfere with other people's action, but then you get to define the values and you get to use your judgment in pursuing them, particularly producing them. So let's look at what's happening in this situation. I think two of the biggest failures are one, the massive failure of testing, and two, the massive failure or fear about scaling, this idea that, oh, we can't have more hospital beds, we can't have more practitioners. So if, just to take it quickly, what if we had freedom in testing versus government-controlled testing? This is a total failure of the government has defined a right and so it gets to define what a good test is or isn't. And guess what? A bunch of bureaucrats got it wrong compared to millions of people being free. That's how could that be at all surprising? And then in terms of scaling, you see all these people saying, oh, the, the system can't accommodate this. Like if you're free people think about, how you, and you had a free system, we would be paying people to scale. We would have a profit motive and be paying people to scale. You'd be able to scale the machines, you'd be able to scale the locations, and you would be free to have people go into the field. The people who are getting out of work in one field would go, would be trained quickly to do the things that they could do. But notice the government controls the pursuit of it. So all of these things are constrained. Now, part of what is good is despite that we have the most capitalism arguably. So there's going to be a lot of really interesting human ingenuity, but in a real capitalist system, we would have individuals, including the smartest individuals, defining what health is, what healthcare is, including testing. And you'd have all this ingenuity and resources going into the to the solving it. It just looks totally different. And many of us are going to die because we're not free right now. Absolutely. And and the scope of the ingenuity, the scope of the innovation is bound by what the government allows us to do. Right. So, yes, they still don't completely regulate pharmaceuticals, although through the FDA, they really do. But they are they're allowing right now pharmaceutical companies to innovate with with uh, with vaccines, but even then they're saying 12 months to 18, 12 to 18 months, really? So we need to test everything the way we test uh, things that have to deal with, with, with prolonged disease. You can't, if somebody's dying in the EC, in ICU right now, we can't inject them with a virus that hasn't been tested on mice yet because God forbid they might die. They're dying anyway. Things like that, uh, innovation is, is, is restricted and slowed dramatically, but, but also, you know, one of the, I just, just heard the Colorado, think about how innovative this is. Colorado is now agreeing that if you were licensed as a doctor in a different state, they'll let you for the purpose of this emergency practice medicine in Colorado. Right? That's perfect. That's isn't a that, perfect. So think about example. the fact, for example, the state of Washington right now and New York city have a lot of cases and they're parts of the country that have very few cases. In, in, in normal times, the, the hospitals would pay doctors to come, let's say from Louisiana, let's say they have few cases, to Washington to treat patients, right? But they can't because they're not licensed in Washington state. Same with nurses, same with lots of the caregiving professions. Um, if, if you're a retired doctor, you might, your license might have expired. It's not clear that you can come back and practice in an emergency situation. All, I mean, and this is multiplied this by thousands of things we can't even imagine. And this will go to my view about how capitalism deals with it. It's hard to imagine. Um, all the thousands of things that the government controls in little and big ways that restrict our ability to respond in flexible ways to a crisis like that. All they do is constrain us. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really think, I mean, you can't guess what it would be like exactly, but I totally think that many of the service people would rapidly go in on a temporary basis to medicine. I mean, if you look at the major, this is gonna, I don't know if we'll talk, I hope we talk about energy. I mean, a lot of what's going on is you just need certain types of machines put near certain people. It's not like you need the most skill in every aspect, but you need human beings able to help people use the machines to build things. I mean, you could just have a, mo I mean, we do this in military, right? 
during certain times we put people in war. That's a specialized yep. thing, but it's just, it's no, the government gets to define it and, and it gets to control the pursuit of it. And so all this ingenuity is completely restrained by the very narrow view of a few people who get to define it and control it. And the whole fear is, oh, what if you do something wrong with your life? And my view is, well, that's, that's my life. That's my decision. But I want to be free to use my judgment. And I want 330 million people to be free to use. Oops, they went again. Your Zoom so I can benefit from the, the ration. I can benefit from their rational uh, judgment. I don't know which million people screwed up my Zoom, but I, I can see it as soon as it fails. I'm trying to time my answers because it's, it's, it's cutting out on a kind of every four minutes, but I'll, I'll uh, that's weird. All right. Um, it may, maybe it's because uh, the Zoom people are working at home and they're not actually in the right. I, I always blame it on running on wind power. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, so, I mean, I think it's it, the whole idea of this is the idea of, of government health care provision. I mean, the empirical evidence, just looking around the world, you can see the massive failures, the massive failures of government-run healthcare systems right now, Italy being the primary, but you're going to see it throughout Europe, and the failure in the United States of those areas where the government is touching, which is way too much. It's not like we have free medicine and, uh, you know, freedom in medicine and that the Europeans are constrained. You know, and testing is the best example because testing should be easy, right? They had two months to prepare. We've known about this for two and a half months, that it was going to come here, that it was going to happen. Nobody in the government, uh, you know, they, they turned down a test that the WHO had because they wanted an American-made test. So the Trump administration, you know, built in America. So they built their own test. It was a failure. They didn't allow private labs. They didn't allow private companies to build their own tests. It had to be done by this. American-made should mean made in freedom, not made by the government. It, 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 it should be use the best test available. Right, in the right, world. right. If you want to improve on it, then yeah, let's improve on it. But in the meantime, use the best test that's available in the world and don't reject it because it's made elsewhere, uh, which is going to relate to a, a, the, the second point, uh, um, the second question about kind of things that this supposedly proves. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, to me, it's the exact opposite. And we'll get to cap how capitalism would respond, but it's exact opposite. What we need is more freedom. And that's true in day-to-day -day life on an everyday basis. And it's true in emergencies. Emergencies don't prove that freedom doesn't work. Emergencies, if anything, prove the opposite. Uh, it, you know, it, freedom works. And it's no accident, by the way, that free countries win wars, that free countries do better in emergencies, the free countries, you know, you've, you've documented really well that free countries do better in um, climate uh, catastrophes, hurricanes, tsunamis, things like that. Uh, free countries tend to be wealthier countries, tend to be more innovative countries, tend to be more entrepreneurial countries. And as a consequence, they deal with shocks, they deal with surprises far better than regimented, controlled, uh, centrally planned uh, countries. Can we, can we talk about energy at some point? Just, I just Yeah, have, I mean, if you want to pull in the parallel with energy, I mean, the energy- yeah, yeah. Or, or just the, there's a parallel here, but it's also there's a requirement. We need energy right now, right? Yeah. So maybe we can talk about. I'll talk about the, just the requirement, and then and then uh, the parallel. But the so you just look at what are we depending on right now? We've talked about if we had more freedom, then there much more productive ability, much more judgment would be brought to bear on this problem. But what are what are we depending on, even with the the limited amount of ability we have? I mean, two things we're obviously depending on that are very related. Are one is machine power. We're depending on these amazing modern machines and these amazing high electricity hospitals to literally you know, prevent maybe millions of people uh, from dying. That's one. And then two, we're, we're, we're relying on human time, on the time of medical professionals to be able to help uh, treat and you know, diagnose and treat and cure people. So both of those are totally dependent upon low cost, reliable, energy. And that's where the fossil fuel connection comes in. Fossil fuels are for billions of people by far the lowest cost, most reliable form of energy they have. And so the, the lower cost, more reliable energy is the more people can afford to use machine power. And the more time is freed up because we have machine power to produce the basics, namely food, water, 
uh, shelter. And so what you have today is we have this amazing ability to respond with all these machines and all these people. But if you had anything like a Green New Deal, what happens is machine power becomes much more expensive and human time becomes much more scarce because it's devoted to manual labor. And it's the kind of, the energy is only partially related to what's happening in Venezuela, but you can see that the decline of the ability to use machine power and the decline of freed up human time, people are, are their time goes to the most crude things. You, you literally regress to a worse and more natural way of life. So I just wanna point out how the whole amazing ability we have to respond both the machine power and the time is totally dependent on the level of our ability to produce energy. And there's nothing that's even close to fossil fuels. So when people are thinking about, oh, I'm, all these lives are being saved. Well, fossil fuels are saving those lives. A absolutely. I mean, you couldn't get the, the foods, you couldn't get the food produced. Think of all the machines that use fossil fuels and you know, produce the food to, to, and then deliver it and then refrigeration and then keep the supermarkets open and all the different stages, every single step in the supply chain. It requires massive amounts of energy. And, uh, you know, that energy, if it was run by wind power, if it was run by solar energy, it would be, would be, you know, the whole food supply chain would collapse and we would be literally starving. Uh, there's no way to supply the billions of people on planet Earth today with the kind of food, with the food we need in a, uh, unless we use fossil fuels, unless we use uh, the cheapest, most efficient form of energy production available right now. Um, and then let me, let me just comment quickly on the parallel uh, issue. So it's, you know, a lot of my focus on, for those of you familiar with my work on energy, is that, you know, with, with looking at fossil fuels, I say, look at it the same way you look at a decision to use an antibiotic. You need to look at both the benefit and the side effect, and you need to weigh them. And what you absolutely can't do is say, my goal is zero side effects. That's all I care about, like zero impact on climate. No, you have to look at your goal is to benefit human life as much as possible. And what you're, what the parallel to what we discussed before is that people, their whole focus is let's reduce the virus to zero. That's all, their whole standard should be what will reduce transmission of virus almost regardless of what it does to individual human lives. And that's why you can have this craziness of saying, yeah, interrupt your life for 18 months maybe, or not even feeling compelled to tell people a plan, or even if you're not sure yet to say like, look, I know this is a huge hardship. We're super scared. Like, but we're going to have a plan. There's going to be a limit on this. There's, there's almost no acknowledgement of value. And you see in practice, people are, are acting this way. The only organization I've seen that seems to value the livelihood in terms of events is the ultimate fighting championships, the mixed martial arts, which I have some background in. Yep. I mean, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're restricting audiences, but they're holding these fights. And these, these fights, I mean, maybe people can't sympathize with this, but these are people's livelihood. They've been spending 12 weeks tens of thousands of dollars, their whole future, they've been, been investing 10 years. Like it should be terrifying to think, I mean, just heart-wrenching to think, oh, I'm going to take this away. Those people should absolutely not do that to infinitesimally reduce some vulnerable people's uh, risk. And it's just, and, that's, that's not, that's a total sacrifice. And what's amazing here is we know exactly who's vulnerable. We know that yeah. if you're over 60 with, with some health issues, over 70, pretty much everybody, over 80, definitely. You're in real danger with this. The, the, the mortality rate is fairly high in these cases if you get it. So it's easy to, it's relatively easy to first tell people in that age group to isolate themselves. Don't see your grandkids. Don't go visit your parents and your grandparents. You know, hire them somebody who can bring them food and who can, who can supply them with the, necess with the necessities. You can do it, you know, there's so many things that we can do to make the lives of the people who really are susceptible to this relatively easy without shutting down the whole of society and without interrupting the values of everybody. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed 
for uh, support for the show. Many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...